Welcome everybody. Um, here I'm presenting Arno Schell from Head of Development for ThingCell and he's going to have a presentation that is titled From Iterators to Ranges. All right, thank you very much and uh, thank you for coming. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about From Iterators to Ranges. Um, what's going on currently in the standard, in the standard library um, Um, okay, so uh, we're going to talk about from iterators to ranges. Uh, the first thing is who is familiar with ranges? Who, is, who knows the boost range library? Okay, I guess very few. Now, who knows the Eric Niebler's range v3 library? Okay, no one. And I guess that's kind of superfluous to ask. No one is using uh, ranges in everyday programming. I think you should. So what I'm, I think what I want you to, what I want you to um, take away from today's talk that you can do your C++ programming much in a much more productive and much more efficient way if you make good use of ranges. Uh, well, what are ranges? Well, when you're using C++ in the old-fashioned way, you would write code like this. You have the std vector, and then when you want to sort the vector, you pull the begin and end iterators out of that vector and call std sort. And then if you want to remove the duplicate elements, you call std unique, again with begin and end. And then you call vec.erase of this thing, again vec.end. That's a lot of mentioning of vec. Pairs of iterators really belong together. They should be one object. So it would be much nicer if you could write something like unique in place of sort of vector, where sort is doing the sorting of the vector and unique in place is throwing away the duplicate elements. Now, before we go on, there is a bug in this piece of, short piece of code. At least it's not entirely generic. And I want you to tell me what is that bug. Which operator does standard sort use to sort the range? Operator less. What does std unique use to throw away elements? The equality operator. Okay, and if these two are not consistently implemented on the T, the whole code is not going to work. And this is also something that range, the uh, good range library will give you. Our range library certainly gives you that, that you use these, these operators more consistently um, because you have functions that package everything together into range functions. Okay, um, why do I think that we in particular know something about ranges? ThinkCell has its own range library. It grew out of boost range. And we have about one million lines of production codes that use that library. And we have the freedom to change both the library and our code as we like, and the, the library grew out of this collaboration between the R code and the library. And I think that's the only way to come up with a good library design. You need a heavy user of that library. You need a large code base to try out your ideas. And that's what we did. We iterated our design until we came up with something that was really practical. And I want to share with you today some of the insights that we got. Before, uh, well, there are ranges, kind of, in C++ 11 already. Uh, there is the range-based for loop. And who is familiar with the range-based for loop? OK, most of you. All right. Um, then there is actually universal access for the std begin std, uh, with std begin std end, so you don't have to call the member function. It will actually, the std begin std end will also work on something like arrays, so that you can use always std begin and std end universally in, in generic code. And, well, no, there's no end. Uh, that's all you have in terms of ranges in the standard uh, C11. C14 didn't change much in that regard. Um, the future is going to be uh, the current pet project of Eric Niebler. 
He has a range of technical specification in the standard committee. And uh, the first, or the, the thing that this, uh, the, this specification, the technical specification does, is to lay some groundwork uh, for ranges and to make basically algorithm, the algorithm header, support ranges. So you have, for example, a function uh, find that doesn't work on two iterators anymore. Instead, it takes a range and uh, internally, it will then just dispatch to std find, pulling the iterators out of the range that you passed in. Um, then he has a bit more advanced uh, range of version three uh, code base on the web. Um, and this is basically what Eric envisions to standardize eventually. It contains more functionality than just basically packaging two iterators together into a range object. And we'll see what this functionality is. Now, first of all, what are ranges? First of all, ranges are the familiar containers. Um, you can call begin and end on them. And uh, that makes them really ranges, that they have a begin and end. And they own their elements. When you copy them, you will copy the elements along with the object. And you have deep constants. If you have a const vector, you can't mutate its elements. In addition to containers, there is this second thing, which are also ranges, uh, the standard committee calls views. And ranges are really containers and views taken together. So what's a view? Well, a view is basically your old iterator pair packaged into one object. Um, it, instead of owning elements, it will actually reference elements, just like iterators do. Um, you have shallow copying, again, just like iterators. Uh, you can copy the reference in all of one. And you have shallow constants. So when you, your object is const, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't mutate the elements. Just like with an iterator, it's const iterator versus iterator, and uh, the, it, the constants of the iterator itself doesn't really matter. Now, what I showed you was these just pa packaged pair of iterators, and that's pretty boring. Uh, there are more interesting ranges that make these, these ranges an actual practical concept. Um, and, and that's really driving the productivity gain you will get from them. So when you have, say, a find, okay, you have a vector of ints, you have a find, and you find an element, yeah, so you have a find, and you're finding an element four, then, um, well, that's a, that's a simple call, you get an iterator back. Now, let's say you want to do the same thing on a structure, and the ints are no longer just plain in there, in that vector, but they're packaged as an ID in structure A. And you have a vector of A's. You would like to kind of, this code to be somewhat similar to that code, because you are, I mean, you're looking for fours at the end, right? So how different can it be? Well, in fact, as you, if you write it like you write it today, it's quite different, because you're using a different function, you're using find if, and that functor that you plug into the find if does basically the extraction of the int, a.id, and the equality comparison together in, 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 one op, in, in one predicate. So they are similar in semantics, these two things, but uh, they are not really similar in syntax. Well, how can we change that? Enters the transform adapter. So down here, what we do is we take the vector and wrap it into a, into a transform that you pass in an extractor function. So what the TC transform does is it returns an object. First of all, it doesn't do much. It just generates an object that references the vector and holds on to that, to that function to execute. And when you then iterate, it's, it's, a, it's a range. When you iterate over that range with begin to end, then the, the function, the std memphin, will be on the fly executed on every one of the elements. So when you're extracting, you're, you're effectively extracting the IDs from the vector. And on, this, on, this extract, on these extracted IDs, you will then run your regular ranges find function with four, and you get the iterator back. Now, to further your understanding of the whole thing, now, what is it pointing to when you're running this? Anyone? It's pointing to int, right? So it's not pointing to a, because basically when you ran the system transform, you turned your vector of a's into 
a range of ints. And so the iterator is now pointing to ints. If you want the iterator to the A's back, there is a function where you can call dot .base on the iterator, and it will actually go back, it will unwrap your transform that you did and give you the original iterator. Uh, maybe to remove some of the magic, here is the implementation of such a transform adapter. Uh, the transform function will give you back an object uh, of type transform range, and it will have iterators, and these iterators contain the functor, and they will contain also the underlying iterator that is iterating over your vector, your original vector of A's. And whenever you are calling the dereference operator, it will actually execute the function on the dereference value and return that. Okay, and that really does the unpacking of, of the ID. And here, well, the base function, easy enough, you just return your iterator. Okay, um, let's talk about a different adapter, and, and that transform and the filter adapter are really the, the bread and butter of, of, of using ranges. Uh, they will already get you if, if you, if you nest them, they will already get you quite far in your code. These are by far the most used adapters for ranges. Um, so here's the filter adapter. What does it do? It takes a vector, again, and it will filter with that predicate, it will filter all the elements out of that vector where the ID equals four. And it will only return these. And again, it's lazy. So when you create this thing, it doesn't do anything. And when you start iterating, it will look at the individual elements and decide whether to pass them on to you or whether to skip them and just, just go on and, and give you back the next one. Here's the implementation. You have a function that is the one that basically decides whether it, that, that's the filter function, whether you pass or not. And you have an iterator, and you have the end iterator. Hmm, why do you have the end iterator? Let's look at the implementation of the increment operator. So what does it do? It increments the it, just goes one further. And then until, if, if you don't hit the end, and there you need the end iterator, it will basically keep filtering until you find something that actually passes your filter, and that's the one where the iterator is gonna stop. Okay, so it's, it's, it's just gonna skip the elements that you don't want, basically. But in order for you to ensure that you don't run past the end, you need that end iterator. Okay, um, pretty good. So now we have two pretty useful components of our range library. Uh, let's see, how does the TC filter of the filter of a filter look like? Okay, let's take a look. Looks like this. You get a huge iterator. When you're using this in your code, and this is actually what boost range does, you're getting iterators which are one kilobyte in size. If you copy them around, things get terrible. Why is that? Well, you have a function. That's the functor three here. Okay, fine. Then you have an iterator. Well, the iterator, the, the inner iterator itself is a filter iterator. So it will return, uh, contain a function and an iterator. And it's again a filter. Well, it will return a contain a function and an iterator and the iterator end. And then this guy will again return the iterator end, which again looks like this. And then that and so on. And so you get exponential growth in your iterator size. Obviously, that's not what we want. So the idea is you have to keep your iterators small. Iterators are copied frequently. They are, they are moved around in your code. You can't have them one kilobyte in size, obviously. Okay. Um, so one idea is to say, okay, we have this adapter object. And you notice that the filter and the transform adapter objects, they were all empty. I just defined the iterator inside. Um, but they can carry data. So why don't we put the data that is common to all these uh, adapters, the function and the end, into this adapter object. And then our iterators, they just reference the range, the, the adapter object, and they carry around the inner iterator. This is now for the filter range. And as you can see, well, your iterators get quite a bit smaller. Um, there is a limitation. Since the iterator is now pointing at the, uh, the adapter object, the iterators must not outlive their range object, their adapter object. And that's actually a requirement that is in the range TS. So the standard 
that you will, the, the thing that you will get in the C++ standard tells you if you pull an iterator out of a range object, you must not use this iterator object once your range object is dead. And this, is, this requirement is essential to get reasonable performance, in particular to reduce the size of the iterator. And that's something that, we actually, that they actually put into the standard uh, once we notice this problem. Okay, so here is now the iterator of filter or filter or filter. Well, you have a range, you have an iterator. Well, that iterator still contains a pointer to its range and the iterator, and it contains a range to its iterator. Well, that's not great, right? It's actually what range v3 does. This is the state of the art of the standard committee, um, but it is not insanely great. We want to do better. How can we do better? Well, let's introduce a new concept. Uh, we call it index. It's kind of like an iterator, except that the operations require that you pass in the range object that this, is, this, that this iterator is off, okay? So, um, and then the operations on the, on the index are actually defined by convention on the range object. So when you have this index range, which is, which is a range implemented via this index concept, um, then you have begin index, end index, which is kind of like begin and end, and you have an increment index that takes the index, which will increment this index. You have a decrement index, which decrements the index, and a dereference. So every time you're implementing these operations, you have the index object as well as the range. Hmm. Well, first of all, well, that's a great idea, but you know, the world is running on iterators. So if someone comes up and say, well, we're gonna, gonna throw away the iterators, we now need this new index concept, and you're gonna rewrite your code all with indices, well, that's unlikely to fly, right? Well, um, luckily, the index, if you have implemented this index range, you can easily implement a generic iterator for index wrapper that turns that index concept back into an iterator concept. And so whenever you have an index range, it's kind of trivial to implement iterators for them. You, you, it's boilerplate. You can do it automatically. Um, so you have iterator for index, it just has a pointer to the range, and it stores the index type of that range, and if you have something like an increment operator, it just calls the range with increment index of that index. Okay, so easy enough. Um, so that's not a problem. Whenever you are, we are now doing index ranges, uh, we, you can use them with iterators, no problem. Okay, so how does that help us to solve our problem? Uh, here's an example of a filter range implemented using this concept. So you have the filter range with a function, the, the filter func uh, function, and a reference to the base range. You don't have iterate, you don't store directly begin end iterators anymore, but you could store a reference to the base range. And you say, okay, my index type is actually the base index type. There's no difference in types. So it's kind of like, well, the filter needs the underlying vector iterator to increment, but it doesn't need much else. That's the essential piece of information. Now, if you increment the index, it, you can ask the base, because you stored it, to increment your index. And you do this until you hit the end or until something passes your functor. And every time for, for increment, for end, for the reference, you can always refer to the base, which we stored here, okay? So together with this iterator for index, you can now build stacks. Remember that the filter index is, no matter how large your stack is, is always gonna be the underlying, in, uh, underlying um, iterator. So if you have a filter of 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 a vector, the outermost filter will still have as its index the iter iterator type of the vector. And then you use our little wrapper iterator for index and now all the iterators you build on this huge stacks, they are all just two pointers, basically. Um, the iterator of the vector and a pointer to the range object, the outermost range object. Okay, uh, that's quite nice. Um, let's go to another difference between what's basically proposed for standardization and what we are doing. The, if the adapter input, uh, who is familiar with L value versus R value? Okay, um, 
if the adapter input is an L value container. Okay, so it's basically a, a VEC here that has been, has been declared elsewhere. And here, you are just generating a filter object on that vector with some predicate. Then um, this will obviously work. But what happens if you turn this into an R value? You're basically inside your, your filter, you are creating the vector, and directly passes into the filter. And this is a quite, quite frequent uh, in, your, in, in code that, that you want to do this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm talking out of experience. Well, the thing is it doesn't compile. Why doesn't it compile? Well, the view is referencing its base range, its base range or container, whatever it is. And in this case, the vector will actually go out of scope as soon as you, uh, you uh, go past the semicolon here. And so when this is an R value, you suddenly have a dangling reference. Certainly not a good idea. And so what the range v3 library says is it doesn't compile. We're not going to deal with this. Um, well, the thing is, there is an alternative in that library to call action filter instead of view filter. And what will it, well, it will actually compile. But what it does is that instead of generating a lazy range, it will directly execute that filter operation on the underlying vector. And basically take the vector, filter it, eagerly, right away, and pass out the, the vector. Hmm. The thing is, I mean, I'm afraid programmers are going to try, oh, view filter doesn't work. Well, then we use action filter. Oh, this works. That's, that's great. So let's use that. Well, you suddenly pessimize your code because you really need to, you, it, it will eagerly filter that whole vector. And even if you only need the first element and then throw away everything else, well, you, you just forced yourself to spend the O of N time to, to filter the vector. So what do we do uh, instead? Yeah, so it's not lazy anymore. Um, so what we are doing in our library is if the adapter is an L-value container, there's just no problem. The filter is going to create a view. Um, it's reference of one copy, shallow constants. Now, if the adapter input is an R-value container, what filter does is it creates a container. It actually aggregates the R value. It moves the R value into an internal variable, in an internal member. Um, and then it's a deep copy. It has deep constants. It's just like a container. But it's always lazy. Because in our mind, uh, on, uh, the, the laziness concept and this containerness are really orthogonal. You can be a container, but still be lazy. And we hope that that avoids these kind of traps that you will get into. Uh, when, you, when you follow this previous approach. And at the same time, uh, it allows you to write compact code because you can, you can nest all these, these things, the things that create the vector and the filtering and so on. <coughs> okay, um, there's one more thing that we have. Uh, it's a bit stolen from the, from the boost range library. They have something similar. Um, the, the more flexible algorithm returns. So when you have a find, usually you return an iterator to the element that you actually found, uh, or end if you didn't find anything. Hmm. Sometimes it may be nice to do something like, uh, like this, where you have, so, so this is an extension where it gets an extra type pack that kind of lets you customize what happens when you found something or when you did not find something. Okay, what pack actually do, gets is an iterator and a range, uh, and there is this special thing, pack singleton, which says, hmm, I didn't find anything, what shall I do? Uh, and that is only past the range. And the standard implementation would look like this. Uh, the, the regular pack just returns the iterator, the pack singleton returns the end of the range. Okay, so what you now can do is document, for example, in your code, if you don't expect the find to ever fail. If you know that something is, or that what, you've, what you are looking for is in the range, then, the, uh, then you can actually document, I'm, I'm not expecting n to be ever returned. And that's, that usually requires this extra assert, uh, and, and it's kind of lengthy to write, but here you can simply say, okay, I'm, I'm going to declare this should actually return something. You can do more. Uh, you can say, hey, um, return me everything that is before the thing that I was looking for. Return the head. 
Okay, so this would do something like it takes this take is, is um, generating a range that goes from from begin to the iterator that you passed in. Okay, so it will basically up to the point where you where you found something, it will give you a range of values. And yeah, we still have this the sort of faults. We still expect something to find something. Okay, um, let me get to a generalization of ranges. So far, ranges, we're always using iterators. In our mind, that doesn't need to be the case. Sometimes you have some code like this, where you are traversing widgets and you pass in a function uh, that using essentially the big old uh, visitor pattern, where every, every widget that you have gets passed in to this function. So here you, you may have a nesting traversal where you pass in the function by reference, and otherwise the function gets called with every single element that you have. And it's a bit like a range, except that, well, you, you iterate in kind of a different way. There are no iterators. And, but still, it, make, it might make sense to write something like this. You say, okay, uh, did my mouse hit anything? Well, the first thing is, kind of a range, you pass in a function and it will just traverse the widgets, and this thing is a little bit like the test function of a normal any off, where you say, okay, get me a widget and I'm just gonna check whether the mouse is, when, when, whether that uh, widget got hit by the mouse. Okay, so it's, this is very range-like, although what you're, what you're iterating over is not an iterator-based range. So how can we fold these concepts together? What we're really doing here is replacing or integrating uh, two concepts of iteration, and I want to want to point them out to you. Um, there is something called external iteration, and uh, it's basic computer science. Um, the the consumer that is consuming the data calls the producer to get the new element. This is what we are used to with iterators. So you are consumer is sitting down here, and whenever you're saying, I don't want another element, I say, star it, and it produces an element, and returns it to the consumer, and then I may say, plus, plus it, and then I again so I star it, and I go into the producer, and produce an element, and it goes back to the consumer. So the consumer is at the bottom of the stack, this is how the stack grows, and the producer is at the top of the stack, and whenever you want an element, you call up into a function, and the functions come back with a new element. Um, you can turn the whole thing around, See, oop, oop, oop. do I have it? Internal iteration. Right, so first of all, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of external iteration. The, the consumer, as I said, is at the bottom of the stack, and you can write contiguous code for this consumer. You can do any kind of logic, uh, and you, you, you have one contiguous code path, and whenever you want an element, you say, give me an element, give me an element, give me an element. Uh, that's easier to write, obviously, um, and it also has better performance um, because for, for the consumer, because the state in which the consumer is currently in is encoded in your program flow. You don't have to restore the state. You don't, have, you don't get called at one point and say, well, where were I? Or where am I? What, what, where, which state am I in? You are in the state that you are while you're executing your program. And you have no limit for stack memory. Whenever you need memory, you just can get, it, get as much stack memory as you want. You can recurse, do whatever you like. Uh, there is no limit. Now, the producer is in a more difficult situation. It doesn't have uh, the, the contiguous code path for the whole sequence. It only has a contiguous code path to generate one single item. And every time it gets called again for the next item, it has to restore its state and decide where am I, for example, in the, uh, in, in the tree that I'm iterating over or so. Um, that makes it a bit harder to write, and it also makes the performance a little bit worse. Uh, you only have a single entry point, so you kind of have this dynamic dispatch at that single entry point where I'm going to continue with in my code flow. And um, there is basically when you when you want to carry around state from one part of the from from producing one element to producing the next element, so from one call to the next call. The only place you really have, you can really can do this is inside your iterator. So inside your iterator, you only have limited space. You can't use arbitrary lots of, of stack space that gets carried between any, any iterator calls. Uh, or you have to go to the heap and allocate the memory there, but that's certainly not very efficient. Contrast that with internal iteration. So the, um, here, 
the producer calls the consumer with, an, uh, to, with, with a new element. This is what we saw with the traverse widgets. So um, here, the widgets are being traversed, and whenever, you are, uh, you, whenever the producer has a new element, it will consume, call the consumer. So it really turns things upside down. The producer is again at the bottom of the stack, and being at the bottom of the stack is great. It has all the advantages that I uh, already talked about. The consumer is now at the top, and it has all the problems that the consumer would have if it's being at the top. Uh, all the problems uh, of, of being at the top of the stack. Now, how can we integrate these two? Well, it would be nice to have both, right? That both are actually at the bottom of the stack. And yes, you can do this. Um, with coroutines. These are really what coroutines are all about. You, uh, whenever you are, you are hitting something that you want to pass on to your, to your consumer, you say yield, and the other guy was waiting in its control flow and picks up the item. And, and quite a few programming languages already have that. Uh, C++ doesn't have it yet, uh, but there are actually proposals to do that. Um, there are basically two ways to do it. One is stackful. You have in, both have an, an arbitrary amount of stack. Um, they're usually implemented as operating system fibers, and that's very expensive. So if you want to write a tight loop, this is not going to be feasible. This is not going to be efficient, because every time you are basically yielding to your other fiber, um, you have to restore its state, you have to switch stack, and, and that's, that's expensive. Um, every fiber is going to take one megabyte, usually, um, on, on Windows 32, I think, uh, of virtual memory. Uh, because you, for, for this coroutine. So it, it's not, nothing that you're going to do to iterate over a bunch of integers. Um, the second alternative is uh, our stackless coroutines. And because of the performance benefits, that's, there is actually a proposal. There's no proposal for stackful, uh, stackful coroutines. Um, but there, you can only yield in the topmost function. They kind of go around this problem of having a limited stack space by saying, well, whenever you are yielding, I, I know that I will analyze the amount of stack that I have to allocate um, for that coroutine um, by yielding only in the topmost function. And, but that limits uh, quite a bit what you can do, because if you, um, one reason that you want this kind of thing is that you are going into, uh, you, that, you are, that you are recursing, and they are naturally, uh, you, you want to yield inside these recursive functions. So, and it's also still a bit expensive because um, every time you yield to the other, to the other, uh, um, other, other fiber, um, you have to find your resume point. So you kind of gonna have something like a dynamic jump, kind of like a virtual function call every time you're doing it. Um, again, if you, are, if you are in a very tight loop and you want to aggressively inline your loops and aggressively optimize the code, that's not something you want to use. Okay, uh, but it turns out internal iteration is quite, a, quite often is good enough. For many algorithms, uh, it's like, like here find or binary search, uh, well find you want an iterator out, so it's gonna be difficult because with internal iteration you don't have, have any iterators, but for each that just works. Okay, and most of the time what you're doing with ranges is for each. You can do accumulate, you can do all of, any of, none of, all these things, they all work with internal iteration. And there's basically no reason why your range library shouldn't support these algorithms that the regular library is supporting with iterators, why it, it should not support this with internal iteration. And our library does that. <clears throat> the adapters I talked about, the filter and the transform, also they actually are implementable with internal iteration. Basically when you're filtering, you are being called with a new element, and if you don't like that new element, you simply return, wait for the next one to come. Um, with a transform, you just pick up the element, transform it, and pass it on. So uh, that's easy to implement also with internal iteration. So we allow ranges that support only internal iteration. And then the any of implementation, for example, looks like this. So you get a range, and again, this range doesn't have any iterators, okay? Uh, it, you, you have this helper function enumerate that basically takes the range and hides the fact whether that range has iterators or not. If it has iterators, it will iterate using iterators. If it doesn't have any iterators, it will call this, this, this for each function inside the range, which will pass out all the elements. And then you have this functor here that you are passing into this enumerate, and it will actually do the work of the any of, um, just ordering the results. 
Now, is that all good? Well, not quite. There's something missing. A regular any off is lazy, right? It will stop as soon as it decided that it's true. So, how do we do that? Hmm. First attempt was, ah, let's throw an exception. Right? Whenever you are you're true, you throw an exception. Well, that's not a good idea. It's too slow. Throwing exceptions is expensive. It's not meant to be for regular control flow. Okay? So second idea was a simple enum. So what we say in our library is when, you are, when your, your, uh, your filter function here returns an enum of that special type break or continue, he wants to tell you something. He wants to tell you, hey, either continue or break. The nice thing about returning this special type is you can actually check at compile time to eliminate this break check. If the functor returns break or continue, then you have to do the check and you have to break when break is returned. But if the functor returns anything else, there's nothing to check. You know he's gonna continue, okay? He doesn't try to tell you anything. So you can just loop like you ever looped before and you don't have to check. Now, um, actually it's interesting that this concept is practical for things other than places where you need internal iteration. For example, when you want to concat uh, two heterogeneous containers. So you have a list and you have a vector and you want to uh, append the, list, the vector to the list. Okay? So the way you write it in our program is like this, concat list vec, and here you are now um, getting the, the contents of both. Well, usually when you want to write this with indices, you would have to do something like a concat range that incorporates these two ranges and it also has to store an index that is either of the type of one range or of the type of the other range. So you first have an, an iterator that iterates over the first range, and once it hits the end, it will switch over to the second range and iterate through that one. So that, that index has to be either of that kind of iterator or that kind of iterator, either of iterator of vectors or of iterator of lists in our case. The thing is that an increment index then is quite complicated. You basically have to switch on that variant. If the variant is of one type, you have to increment it for the first range and check whether you hit the end. And if you hit the end, you have to reassign that index with the begin of the second range. So you have to kind of do the skip over and, and concatenate the two together. And you have to do this every time you're incrementing your index. So you have quite a few checks that you have to do and it would be nice to avoid them. Uh, Dereference actually is similar. There's also the switch on the index, and, and again, you have a branch with every, every time you're actually dereferencing your iterator. Hmm. Well, with generator ranges, you can actually do this very efficiently. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, in our case, these operator parentheses here is um, the, the, the operator that enumerates the elements. So that concat range, on top of having this iterator functionality, which it also has if you want to use it, it for efficiency uh, this time, it actually has that generator interface, this, this internal iteration interface, that will just plug the elements into this function object. And it does that by, again, calling the internal iteration of these two ranges that it incorporates, one and then, and then, then the other. And there you don't need any checks for, for end. It's, it's very efficient. And um, so, so algorithms that are actually capable of dealing with internal iteration like this any off would actually use this form of iterating over ranges um, because, it's, because it's more efficient. All right, uh, that was it. Thank you very much. We do have um, that range library public um, on GitHub if you want to play with it. This is the URL, you also find it on our website. And uh, to wrap up, I want to say this, I hate the range-based for loop. It's forbidden at ThinkCell. Why? Because instead, people then write this, the good old for loop, instead of using algorithms and writing it nice and compactly like this. So get away from the range-based for loop. I don't know why they got this thing in there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Arno. So we have some time for questions, so raise your hands and I will run to you.
So hi, I have one question. Uh, since your library is, uh, seems to be quite a bit uh, more powerful and better than the Boost version or the you know standardization version, is your company involved in standardization efforts to push that upstream into we, SDL? We do, well, we are we are actually the the, the sponsors of the C++ com, uh, committee in Germany. Uh, because there was no one else. I mean, Siemens didn't want to do it, so we did it. Um, so we are sponsoring the, the participation of the Germans in the C++ Standard Committee. We didn't push this as a standardization effort. Why? Well, if you've ever been to a standardization committee meeting, it is a very political and very long-winded process. And um, so far, we've been, we, we spent our time rather on improving the code than, than pushing it into standardization. So it's it's simply a matter of, of spending the time making the effort. And uh, certainly what, what's going to come out of the current uh, implementation or the, the current standardization effort, the ranges, um, is not bad. And in particular, it doesn't do anything that would preclude later improvement. So it, that's, that's basically what we did as a gatekeeper. This was one, this one thing with the lifetime of iterators and ranges. I mean, if that would have been voted the other way around, where you say, okay, you can keep using your iterators even if your range is gone, um, then basically the, the, the door would have been slammed shut to ever make something that actually works. You, you would have been in a, in a dead end. And, and that we actually prevented. So, so that was, is kind of like the scope of our effort. Um, other than that, I'd rather write code than doing political work. I'm sorry. Any more questions? None? Okay, then uh, big thanks to Arno again. Thank you very much. And um, there is actually, if people haven't noticed, there's ice cream outside. And I'm going to um, be in the, um, um, near our booth for the next half hour. And, uh, and yes, we are hiring. Thank you very much. <laughs>